Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 5, segment 12, and we'll break out our good friend the debugger one more time. This time we'll use it to illustrate how we can inspect memory locations in the running program. In the process we'll also review a little bit how pointers and arrays work in the C programming language, as this is fundamental to eliminating things like buffer overflows and other common causes of program failures and security issues. So let's go back to our printbuffs program. This time we'll compile it with dash g3 to ensure additional debugging symbols, which we'll use in a moment to access to find macros, which otherwise would not be available to us in the debugger. Remember, in our previous video we had handled the edge cases of providing a negative or a much too large number here, but we didn't discuss what happens when we provide a reasonable or normal number. Let's give it a try and specify 8 as the size of the buffer used to process the data we feed the program. We enter 8 characters, hey now exclamation point, and the program prints this. Buff is hey now, which seems right, but buff 2 is empty now? Buff 3 looks right though, what's going on here? Let's run it again, this time we enter 7 characters and get buff looks ok, buff 2 starts out ok, but what's going on here? Why does it say it's buff 3? Time to break out the debugger I'd say. We'll break in print buffs and run the program again. There. Now n is 8, so we call malloc 8. Likewise for the other two buffers, all three are now 8 byte buffers. Let's make sure they are all valid. Ok, all three are valid pointers, all empty at this point. So far so good. Now we execute the next line, where we copied data2 into buff2. Yep, that worked as expected, everything normal here. On to the next line, where we now copied data3 into buff3. Yep, that looks right too. Next line, where we call gets. Hey now. P buff. And that looks good too. But buff 2 looks wrong again here. How did that happen? We didn't do anything to buff2 after we called str copy, and we had confirmed above that buff2 contained the right data. And buff3 is still correct. But it looks like what is in buff2 over here is actually the data we had meant to write to buff3. So let's take a look at the memory locations of each of these arrays. One is b0.10 and the other is b0.18, while buff is b008. What exactly is buff? Buff is a char star, or what we call a string. But a string really is nothing but an array of characters, right? And an array is nothing but a pointer to the beginning of the string, the first character with the assurance that the next element is another character until you find a null. So if we inspect the location where a buff points to, we find a single character at b008, the h from hey now. That's the same as saying buff0, right? The next character then is buff1. Ok, so far this makes sense. Now, in GDB we can do more than just print a given variable. 
we can also examine any memory address. For that, we use the X command, which then takes a modifier which tells GDB how to present the data at the given address. Here, if we say X slash C, of this address, then we are saying print the value at this address as a character. And so we get the same H ASCII character here. What do we find at B009? That's just one byte further, so yep, that's where the E of hey now is. But B008 is the address of buff. We can also say print the address of buff plus 1, and we'll again find the same E there. That is, an array subscript notation is the same as referencing the beginning memory address and adding the offset. So pointers and arrays are just about the same thing. Now, remember that the address given here is in hex, so what is the last element of the string hey now? Hey now is 7 characters but we know that all strings are null terminated, so we can look at the 8th byte from the beginning address. b008 plus 8 is b00f. And yep, that's where we find the null byte. Now, what's buff2 again? buff2 is at address b010 which is exactly one byte after b00f, and we had written the string hello, I'm buff2 to that location. Here, let's verify that the data we thought we had written here was indeed that. For that, we use info macro. which shows the right data. But how large is that data? That's 17 bytes. But up here we had allocated only 8 bytes of data for buff2. So malloc went out and said, oh, you want 8 bytes of dynamically allocated memory? Sure, no prob, I can squeeze that in right here and handed us back a pointer to a chunk of memory that was exactly 8 bytes in size, starting at B010. Then we asked malloc to get us another pointer to a chunk of memory 8 bytes in size for buff3. And malloc said, sure thing, here you go, and returned a pointer at location B018. That was reasonable. Malloc knew that the space from B0 to B017 was reserved, but anything after that was fair game. But that location is directly after the previous pointer, and so if we look at what is at the address of buff2, B010, plus 8, then we get, of course, B018 the address of buff3. In other words, when we ran str copy of data2, we wrote 17 bytes of data starting at b010, but then called str copy with data3 writing 17 bytes of data at b018. That is, this over here is actually buff3. When we say print buff2, we are effectively telling GDB begin at the address of buff2 and then print as a string the contents. A string is defined as going on until a null character is encountered, but our SDR copy of data3 overwrote the null at the end of buff2, so that print buff2 continues to print data until it finds the null at the end of buff3. Let's try something else. We break in line 25. And I guess we don't need the first breakpoint any longer, so we delete that. We run the program again and stop right before we call gets. 
Here are all buffers, once again, just like before. Now we run gets, but we enter 8 characters, not 7. Buff is now... Hey now! Exclamation point! Which is 8 characters. And buff 2 is... Nothing. Why is that? Buff begins at 4008 and contains 7 characters. So 4008 plus 7 contains the last character. The exclamation point. But strings are null terminated, so 4008 plus 8 is... Yep, null. But that address, 4010, is the address of buff 2. So by allocating an 8-byte buffer but entering 9 bytes, the 8th character of how exclama hey now exclamation point plus the trailing null, we overflowed buff 1 and wrote null into the first byte of buff 2. Now if that is correct, then we should still find the remainder of the data we copied into buff2 at the memory locations beyond 4010, right? And yep, at 4010 plus 1, or 40011, there's the E, one byte more and we find L, and so on and so on. So here we observe something important. Writing beyond the boundaries of a buffer does not necessarily lead to a segmentation fault. It just means that you're writing data into the given memory location. If that happens to be the address of another pointer, then you're simply overwriting that data. Here, let's see if we can illustrate this by example. Let's delete all breakpoints and just run the program. We enter 8 character string, meaning the trailing null will cause the first byte of buff2 to be null, which is why now buff2 looks empty to us, even though there are other characters after the null. Buff3 remains as expected. Now if we run it again and enter a longer string, what do you think will happen? Here we enter 16 characters and get buff1 containing the full 16 with the second 8 overflowing into buff2 and the null at the end of this string flowing over into buff3. And so we know how to overflow and place content we'd like to be in buff3 into that location. This is buff3. So, how do we avoid this problem? Well, instead of willy-nilly writing data into buffers, we should use strn copy and be careful to never write more data than the size of the allocated buffer. which is not the length of the data, but rather the size of the buffer. But let's look at the manual page anyway. Note that strn copy does not null terminate the data. Meaning, we have to do this ourselves. So, we do this here explicitly. Then we repeat this for buff 3. Let's give it a try. 
we again enter a longer string and wait we observe the same situation why is that i thought we had fixed this ah, again to the debugger here let's take a look at the different buffers again before we call gets Aha, buff 2 and buff 3 are correct. We only wrote 8 bytes into these buffers as we should have. But now when we call gets, we once again overflowed buff and thereby buff 2 and buff 3 too. This is because here we are well beyond the SGRN copy, which was only used to initialize the buffers. And remember, when we compiled the code, the compiler gave us a warning. It very explicitly told us to not use get, exactly because it does not do any boundary checking. The manual page is equally unambiguous. Programs should never use this function. So let's replace our call to gets with a call to fgets. We instruct fgets to not read any more than the size of the buffer we allocated. So now We no longer overflow any buffers. All right, I think this will have to suffice as far as GDB is concerned. Like so many other Unix tools, it's something that you just have to use a bit to get the hang of. But once you do, you can't really live without. In this video, we built on top of the lessons from the previous videos and showed that we can inspect arbitrary memory locations using the x command. When doing so, we define the format of the memory location and can thus print, for example, characters or strings. We also saw that we can use a debugger to really understand code execution and from there better grok pointers and arrays in general. We saw that a string is really nothing but an array of characters and arrays are nothing but sequential memory locations which can access by a simple pointer arithmetic. By incrementing the address of a pointer, we can iterate through the array. And so star pointer plus one is the same as pointer subscript one. While we knew that strings are null terminated, we were also able to illustrate what happens when there is no null, or the null is placed earlier in the array. In our code, we then showed that overflowing a buffer, that is, writing beyond the memory address that was allocated for a given buffer, does not necessarily lead to a sec fault. In fact, the sec fault is actually the best case scenario, since at least here your program fails. A much more risky scenario was the one we observed, whereby overflowing one buffer lets you control the content of memory addresses and use elsewhere. Now most of this is not something that's strictly speaking part of debugging, but I hope that I was able to show you that you can use the debugger to deepen your understanding of the program you're analyzing. In this series of videos, I tried to give you an idea of what a debugger is capable of. As I mentioned before, if you learned nothing else but that you can use GDB to pinpoint your sec faults, then that alone is a win. But I still recommend that you consider finding a good tutorial for your preferred debugger and follow it. There's so much more to learn. For now though, we'll stop our coverage of the debugger here and move on to other development tools in our next video. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Cheers.